this week I'm excited to bring to you a guest from Daytona, Florida. Yes, it's during spring break, but he lives there, so I'll have to ask him what it's like to live in paradise, if that is paradise, but I am a big NASCAR fan. Uh, Charles Vega. Charles, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Joel. I really appreciate being on. This is exciting. Now, I do like to set for our listeners the scene. I have interviewed people who were actually on the beach in in, uh, Maui, uh, in Hawaii, uh, Australia, Germany, and Puerto Rico. So where are you? No, I already kind of let it out there, but you, you are talking to me today from Daytona? Daytona Beach, Florida. Today, it's just a beautiful, sunny day in Florida. Now, and I, when I moved to Florida, I lived there for about five years. I tell people that was my five-year Disney vacation and SeaWorld vacation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I remember the very first night I was in Orlando, I went to the grocery store. It was a, it was a Albertsons, I believe. And uh, it was like, it was October. It was like 60 degrees. And I was in my shorts and flip-flops. And the, there were other people in that Albertsons wearing parkas. Uh, I thought, really? You're wearing a coat when it's 60 degrees? What What are you like? Are you like the, do you think 60 degrees is cold or would you be wearing shorts and flip-flops? Well, uh, I guess when you've been in Florida, as long as I have, it's been about 30 years. Uh, it's going to be, we're going to be wearing a, a, a long sleeve shirt. Okay. But uh, when we get the Canadians or people that come from the cold, right. colder state, they look at us cross-eyed and like, are you kidding me? Yeah, I mean, my wife doesn't get in the pool unless it's 83 degrees. Oh, so. <laughs> I remember my wife and I went to the beach, and I think it was around February, the first year we were down there. And uh, yeah, there were some people jumping in the ocean. And when, when February, I thought they must have been from Canada. Uh, that's the yeah, only explanation. Exactly. <laughs> so or our, from, you know, Montana or someplace, and they're used to it, you know? So right. that's what people get used to. You st- you, you're here a while, you're used to the, the warmer weather, and... You go someplace that's cold to visit somebody, and like, oh my gosh! But you know, uh, cold weather is a lot of great sports to do too. So you know, skiing, snowmobiling, there's all kinds of great things to do. So you have your your positive things on both sides of the coast. Now, when you think of Daytona, at least for me, I think of NASCAR. I think of Daytona Beach. And since I lived in Orlando, I also think of Bike Week. And so um, what, what is it like there living in Daytona? Do you take in the, the local scene? Or is it because you live there, it's just, yeah, you, you kind of get over it? No, actually, we're, we're big uh, car fanatics. My wife and I love classic cars, and we, we go to the NASCAR races or watch it on TV. Um, it's exciting. I mean, I'll tell viewers that, when you first get out there, the difference on watching it on TV and being there is you feel it when you're being there. When a car passes you at 180 miles an hour, it just roars, and you wow. can feel the excitement pass you. So there is a huge difference between watching it on TV and being there. Even if you have an HD 60-inch TV, it's still a, a huge advantage to being there. So do you um, regularly go there live? I don't say all the time, but we probably do it once or twice a year on different things. We just went to a bike race a weekend for the first time. I've never been to uh, sport bike racing, and that was exciting. Those guys, man, just when they pass by you again, it's just like, bam. It was even hard to follow them with binoculars, but it's exciting. It's something fun to do and gets you out of the house. And, uh, you know, I'm not a motorcycle person, but um, even when actually with Bike Week just happened, we're not motorcycle people. Uh, with the pandemic, we didn't do it this year. But, heck, we put on our leather jackets and we, we blend. Right, right. You know? <laughs> blend right you in, know? put on the fake tattoos, we, you're good to we'll, go. We'll go to the restaurants and bars and we'll blend and, you know, we got our leather on. We're, we're having a good time. So right. we do enjoy it, yeah. I, uh, I, I've done a couple CLEs in uh, Bristol, Tennessee. I, I did one in Knoxville, and a lady who attended my class was the general counsel for the Bristol Motor Speedway. She invited me over to uh, to Bristol and do a class there. So I got to do a class at the Speedway. And I'm telling you, I was in heaven. She took me out in her car, and we just drove around the Bristol track. Now, are you familiar with the Bristol Motor Speedway? 
No, I'm not. It is. I know Daytona. Daytona is big. What is that? Two and a half mile track there in Daytona. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is a half a mile track. It is small. You are going around. It is the I think the largest coliseum in North America because it's all enclosed like a big football stadium, and so it's a very short track. And the point there is the embankments are so incredibly steep. We were driving around this track, and she asked me how fast do you think we're going. I thought. 150 miles an hour, and we were really going fast around it. She goes, no, no, we're only going 50. But that's how fast it felt because you had that kind of a gravity right. pull as you were going around. Have you ever actually driven around the Daytona track? No, that I haven't done. I've been almost uh, all around the track on the inside field, and, and we've had box seats and everything, but I, we've not done that. But anybody that has, and they actually have tours in right. Daytona, where they'll take you on, on a bus, and just take you off that 30-degree angle, and everybody loves it. It's something that we haven't done yet, so you reminded me we're going to have to do that. Hey, yeah, if you get a chance to go out with the general (laughs) counsel of the Daytona Motor Speedway, jump at that chance. That is a lot of fun. In fact, that just gave me an idea. I should do a podcast while she is driving me around the Bristol Motor Speedway. That that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I could do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Great idea. Well, um, all right. Well, I wanted you on this show because you have a fascinating story. Uh, so I want you to go ahead and, and just kind of tell your story, but just kind of to, to lead off, uh, you came to law late in life. Now, uh, so I, I, I just got to know why. And so I hope you, you include that in part of your story. Um, <laughs> what led you to go to law school? What, how were you? You were 60 years old when you went to law school? I started at 57. 57. All right. Mm-hmm. I got to know why. What caused someone who at the, the age of 57 to say, you know what? I'm bored. I want to go to law school. It was something that I've always wanted to do. And then, you know, you have kids and you, you get a job. And, and the job, most of the jobs I had were, you know, which required travel. So I was on the road a lot. Um, and, uh, and it was just in the back of my mind year after year. And one day, you know, my kids were finally, you know, not finally, but out on their own. doing. Their <laughs> hey, thing, I heard it. You know? Freudian slip. <laughs> finally. They're and, and, and then I just said, you know, I wasn't happy. <laughs> Basically, what, what I was doing, I thought I could do more. I should say I didn't feel I wasn't miserable, but I just thought, right. you know, I'm more capable of doing other things. And it was a challenge. And I talked to a couple of people. I'm like, yeah, you can. I knew somebody that did it at 55. And I go, heck, I can do it. Yeah. So I took the LSAT and I got accepted to one of the law schools. Um, and now, was there a certain, I went to school. Was there a certain area of law that really said, I, w- I want to study this. Or this is why I want to go to law school. Or was it just law in general that drew you to going to law school? Well, I'll say in general, but I did have some things that I did want to do. I've worked in business, commercial world all of my career, so that I was comfortable with. Okay. And then the other thing I really thought would be exciting was personal injury. Ah. So my practice today does personal injury, and we work with a lot of businesses. What but, about personal uh, injury drew you to law school? It was just the fact that there's, it varies so much. I mean, it's not just automobile accidents. People get hurt in, um, in places that things happen to them. We've had uh, one case we have now is a child got their finger cut off in a in a daycare center. I mean, you know, just so many different variables on that. I found that to be very interesting and be able to help somebody who was seriously hurt. Now, what uh, I what what draws me to personal injury, and I, I'm a constitutional lawyer, but what what draws me to personal injury law is how much the public has been. Oh, I don't know what the right word for this is, but duped. Uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of misrepresentation out there when it comes to the need for personal injury law. And let me just kind of give you a real quick example of what I'm talking about: the McDonald's hot coffee case. Are you familiar with that case? I I did read a little bit about that case years ago. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Here is my problem with it. If you go out there and talk to Joe and Jill on the street, just your average American about that case, they would tell you, 
oh, that's an example of, of a horrible law, horrible, horrible lawyers. That's a greedy person who tried their luck at the litigation lottery and they won, won millions of dollars just simply because they spilled a little bit of hot coffee on themselves. What? You didn't know coffee was hot, but that's kind of the mindset that the public has. And then when you actually learn about the case, you realize, oh, wait a second here. No, this is horrible. This, these were third degree burns. Third degree burns, right. I was just going to say that. Yep. They yeah. were third degree burns. In yep. the crotch area. So we're not talking on the arm. In the right. crotch area. This lady, the the, the driver, um, she was not the driver of the car. She was the passenger. So why are you driving, putting hot coffee in your crotch area? That's not it at all. She was actually a passenger. It wasn't even driving. It was sitting in a parking stall when this happened. And here's the worst bit about it. McDonald's already had received 700 complaints about how their coffee was scalding people and they responded by saying we don't care we like the reputation of having hot coffee and so we'll just keep going here because we we can get more coffee by by uh, brewing it this hot and we'll make more money we don't care it's causing all this damage to people and so the only reason why mcdonald's changed was because of the lawsuits. And so it does a lot of real good corporate America. I know it's going to shock a lot of people. Sometimes does not act in the best interest of the consumers. They act in the best interest of their pocketbook. And so sometimes those interests collide. You know what? I'm going to get off my soapbox here right now. And and, <laughs> and, well, and I'll just say to finish that is just the, sometimes the media just sensationalizes it to, to get ratings. So, yes. you know, but, and so, but for me, law school was about learning about, everything that you could possibly learn about the law, which is almost impossible because it gets so detailed and in-depth. But I will tell you that I loved going to law school. Now, Absolutely did you quit your it. job when you no, went to law school? I worked full-time during the day. I traveled, at, uh, I've traveled, like I said, 90 miles each way. Wow. I would listen to podcasts on the way there, you know, for, for, for about law. And on the way back, I would class would end usually by eight, seven or eight, depending on the class. I'd stay in the library till 10, then drive home, then to be at work at eight, leave again that day. And four nights a week, I would do that and sat on the couch and gained 30 pounds reading every weekend. <laughs> now, you know? set the stage for me here, just because I'm, I'm curious about the area. You live, you lived in Daytona. Where did you go to law school? 90 miles away. Is that Orlando then? That's Jacksonville. Oh, Jacksonville. That's right. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you went just right down 95 there to 95, Jacksonville. 95, yep. And, and then... Here's the thing about law school. They are very adamant about you being on time, right? <laughs> right, so, right. Because they want, you, they want you to make sure you're on time for court, things like that. Well, 95 is usually pretty clear between Daytona and Jacksonville, but not all the time. There were t I had to leave as early as I could because I was, was afraid that traffic, an accident. There was one time that I could recall being stuck because there was a, a, a tractor trailer, and I was panicking. I called a friend of mine, called Tell a professor, I'm on the highway. I don't want to be marked <laughs> late, you know. And, and literally, you know, I was just scared to death because basically they they take your grade point average down if you have three latenesses. So they're really serious about this. So wow. if you've got a B average, you're all of a sudden a C because you were late on the highway. And I don't have to tell you, law school is brutal. You know, they, 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 the grade point average on that is tough to get. And then it's scored where, you know, it's, it's, um, there's a curve on it. So, you know, the bottom 20% in our school were automatically failed each class. I mean, it right. was brutal. Oh, it's, it's a straight bell curve. Uh, and now that, that shocked me when I went to law school. I'm, I, I'm glad that you said it's the same thing now. But we all went to high school and college, and there was great inflation. Everyone got A's. They handed them out like Halloween candy. You know, it, it was very easy to get an A in high school and graduation or, high, or college as long as you did the work. Law school... No, I remember my first properties class. Uh, we had about 70 students in that class, I'm guessing. And the professor said, look, I'm only handing out two A's. That's it. I don't care how brilliant that third person is. There's only going to be two A's handed out here in right. this class. It's a strict bell curve. And so it, it is kind of intimidating. Very intimidating. I was so thrilled. Um, I only, I say only, but I got three A's from the entire time I was there. To me, that was like a major accomplishment. I just couldn't believe it. It was. I actually, yeah. So law school was brutal. I loved it. But one thing I'll say 
is I totally felt that everything I learned I could use versus undergraduate. Now, what do you mean you know? by that? Well, I find that, you know, you you may not – when people ask a question, like we do free consultations, and you always get all kinds of crazy calls and different things, but you know enough to be able to ha- answer some basic questions, and if it's not, you know where to look to find more. So what I mean by that is just that law covers so many aspects of different things that if you learn a little bit about it, you know where to go to find the, right. the, the answer, or you were able to answer it based on uh, uh, the level of the question that's being asked. But I just loved it. I really loved going to law school, and you know it was brutal because of the time constraints I had. But um, I just loved it. I, even though with the, even though I was driving a long ways, I tried to make use of that time. But I, I didn't bother me because I was reaching my goal. You know, one day at a time. Now, when you went to, to the law school, were you the oldest person in your law school class? No, I was not. Which really? <laughs> wow, I did not expect that answer. So, you know, you go to class and you see somebody go, hey, I'm not the oldest one in the class. It's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, so uh, that was pretty good. And, you know, you, you make friends and um, there's some famous people. I won't mention names, but, you know, that are there that. Uh, who I'll just say he, he was a he's a, a lead guitarist for a major band went to law school and I really like, be, yeah became friends with him and and they're like why are you why are you going to law school and he's around the same age and he's like well I want to help other band members do the right contracts and do the right thing for them and interesting I, I mean I commend that you know it's just it, it was I met so many great people um, professors and other students who really were ambitious smart, you know, I really felt like it was a great experience as well, I can say. Now, I, I will uh, agree with that, and I want to pile on as well, saying when they, you know, law school is three years, and that does seem intimidating. It does seem like, wow, three years, that's a long time to go to school. It's a big chunk of my life. But two things about that. One is, it's only three years. That time flies by fast. I mean, I, I, I remember I just started law school and all of a sudden, boom, you're 3L and it, it went by that quickly. And, and then secondly, the journey was great. As you said, when you're actually in class learning the law, these professors are experts in this area of law. They, they know how to make it interesting. I really enjoyed my law school classes and I didn't want law school to end. Uh, it was one of the greatest times in one's life especially those summer internships. Uh, life does not get better than the summer of after your 2L year. Uh, but nonetheless, when... So what was your thought process as you're going through through law school? I mean, did you have a, a goal in mind that you wanted to to reach and, and achieve when you got out of law school? Or were you just, try, or were you just going through the process and say, I'm going to see what doors open on the back end? Well, I guess I'll say I originally thought that I would work for somebody else and for a little while, and then open my practice. So that was my goal going in is, you know, get through law school, pass the bar, get your license, work for somebody, get a little acclimated to it, and um, then open my practice. But it turned out that for me, I like talking to people and being in front and working with people. And not, I'm not the person that sits in the back office and does the research. That's right, okay. just not me. So a lot of this, the uh, I'll say the bigger firms would, that's what they really wanted you to do. And you kind of, in my opinion, would be kind of lost in the background. And that's just not me. And some of the smaller firms, you know, they don't pay enough. So I decided to really just do it on my own. And I opened up my firm um, two years ago. And the great thing about it is I've made such great um, friendship with other attorneys that have helped me along the way. Um, it's like I call it uh, standing on the shoulder of giants, where people have been so cooperative in helping with cases or even just forms. Like when you open up a law firm, you have to have a library of forms. Right. Well, you know, what form do I use for this? And each jur- jurisdiction is different. So I'd be asking, you know, I'll, I'll call them my friends that were, hey, can you have a, a motion to strike? Yeah, here you send out. And you, you use the same format. So. I couldn't do it without that kind of support. And I found that other lawyers to be so receptive and so helpful that it really made things work. 
is the best way I could say that. Now, how the did you make? Camaraderie was outstanding. How did you make these these friends? Were these friends that you made during law school, or did you just meet them, you know, at, at certain bar events after you became a lawyer? So it's all of the above. So yes, during school, you know, you make friends, and then also I went out into the community and said, "Look, I'm new." I started just talking. I cold called a bunch of uh, attorneys that were prominent in the area. Really? And I said, "Look, I'm new." What do you think I ought to do? Should I work for a company? Should I open my own practice? And, you know, they were very helpful in, in providing some insight. And uh, as time went on, we got a little closer and were very helpful once I opened up my practice. So it really was getting out in the community, talking to people. I've been in this area a long time, so I know a lot of people, but it really was all of the above. And I feel that I'm a friendly person. I'm, you know, and. Um, developed good relationships over the years, and the people that I that became new friends, we became pretty close on on, on a lot of things. Fascinating. Now, now I, I forgot to mention earlier, but you also are a motivational speaker, so I know you have some insight into how to motivate people. Um, wh- what lessons can you, you give us, or any, any little tidbits uh, to pass along the way here uh, to our listeners about goal reaching, about you know, achieving your, your dreams. Uh, any thoughts along those lines? Absolutely. So I always felt, you know, right now, I'll give it a go back a little bit. I'm actually a fifth degree uh, black belt master instructor. And, th- and in that case, you have small goals. I'm going to get go from white to yellow and go to green. And you, and you reach those goals. And eventually you get to black. And then there's different levels of black. Belt. So the same thing applies with any goal you want. You may want to be a lawyer. You may want to be a doctor. Well, start off here and get to that point. Then get so in law school, get get a good uh, mark on the LSAT. Get into law school because the hardest thing is to get in and then to get out. Get through each class one at a time. I'm going to get through the semester. Here's my GPA. Here's what classes I need to take step by step by step until you reach the ultimate goal. So when I'm talking about martial arts, it's the belts. Go to the next belt. Learn the different techniques that are required for that. In law school, look at the next goal. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, you know, um, to reach your goal, the first step is the most important. And you just have to make that first step that I'm going to do this. And then don't look back. Just keep going forward. Don't let anybody tell you it can't be done. Don't let anybody give you an excuse to quit. Right. Just keep going to the next level till you reach. Because every major goal requires smaller steps to get there. It's not like you go from, <clears throat> go from uh, let's just say, I'm going to finish college and now next I'm going to be a doctor. You have right, to right. go through all of those different steps to get there. You have to apprenticeship. You know, whatever it is you've got to do to reach there. Go there and write your goals down. People say that's silly. You know what? Some people can do it in their head. Some people put posters in their room. Right, right. You know, I'll tell you, for me, I have a poster in my office of of, uh, Sylvester Stallone, and it talks about the um, everybody everybody gets hit, but you got to keep moving forward. It's like. You know, you can take the hits, just but you got to keep moving forward. Everybody's going to be let down in some way. Everybody's going to have some kind of failure. They're not going to meet something, but don't let that stop you. I uh, I kind of just related to you might get kicked in the head a couple of times, but keep fighting, keep going forward. Right, right. That's how you be successful. I did not know you were a Sylvester Stallone fan. If I had known that, this interview would have started off a lot differently. I am a huge <laughs> Rocky fan. I have in my office, actually it's my man cave, but that is kind of my office. I have the poster uh, in Rocky One. You know, the poster they actually had up on the fight where Apollo Creed was going to play, uh, you know, fight Rocky in the movie. They right. had that, that. So I had that poster up in my in my man cave. But um, yeah, the, my favorite Rocky quote it was I forget which Rocky it's from, but. It's where he says it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down it's how many times you get knocked down then get back up again uh, hey he he is actually very inspirational i i do like rocky uh, slash sylvester stallone not so sure about rambo though i'm sure rambo is a good guy as well <laughs> but, no I, I, i'm with you but you know i'll just tell you the story that i i uh read about him which i thought was very inspirational was he was dirt poor 
and he's the one that wrote the original screenplay, right. The Rocky. And it got turned down numerous times by people. And even he had to sell his dog, I heard, to make to pay for food. <laughs> right. I mean, the guy the guy was down and, and out, but he didn't. He said, I want to star in this show. And somebody, after so many chances, took a chance on him. I think and, also he turned down someone who offered him money, but did, yes, did not want him to play the lead. $300,000 is what I heard. Yeah, and, and someone else is going to play the lead. He says, nope, I, I'm going to play the lead here. This is me. Uh, and so... Yeah. Uh, well, hey, we could talk Rocky all day yeah. long. The uh, quote I'm thinking about is, how, it's not how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Yes. Great quote. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that a great quote? To me, that's, that's motivation. That's how you get ahead. And, and for somebody like him, he was he was down and out. And, and somebody took a chance on him, and it became what it is today. You know, you just yeah. gave me a great idea. We should do a CLE on Rocky-isms. Uh, you know, what things <laughs> Ro- Sylvester Stallone or Rocky said that we can apply to the practice of law, and I am sure we could fill up an entire day's worth of classes, and at least I'll I'll be entertained. I'm not sure anyone else will be, but I, I, I love Rocky. My, I like what you're saying. So I started my business, you know, about now six years ago, and, and to be honest, looking back, I had no idea what this business would end up being. Uh, but like you, I like what you said. It's just it, it, the first step is it, so critical because you don't know what that fifth step is going to be, but you're not going to get into the fifth step until you take the first. And there's a lot of read and react in the business world where problems come up, opportunities come up. So you got to adjust along the way. But if you're not moving, you never get to that point where you can um, you know, make those uh, decisions on that fifth step. I, I, great, great concept. Uh, it all starts with the, the, the first step. All right, so, so how did you get to where you are now? Well, what kind of practice do you have now? Well, we do personal injury. We, okay. do, we work with businesses and commercial. Uh, we do real estate, uh, and we do some probate. So right. those are the, we don't do any... Any family law or um, I come from a cop family, so I, I'm not going to do any criminal defense. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so um, uh, what 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 thoughts do you have for our listeners as far as legal tips? And I know this is this. I'll give the disclaimer. This is not legal advice because you're from Florida. Some of our listeners are not from Florida. These are just general ideas on concepts that one might be want to hear about. All right. So with, with that as a disclaimer, you have a couple tips for us. Yeah, I'll say a couple of things we run into quite often is when people are buying a house, you know, they're excited, you know, uh, particularly when they're buying a house that's uh, secondhand or thirdhand or it's years old. If it's more than 10 years old, you know, you start having more problems with house. And people sometimes think that the realtor promised this or the seller promised this, and then they close and now they have all these problems and you discover more problems. And the reality is that they should have hired an attorney before they they even signed the real estate contract. Because one of the things that's in the real estate contract that people don't realize, there's a period there that you can get an inspection. It's usually eight or ten days. Right. That basically is a get out of jail card, meaning that you can get out of that contract if you find something wrong with the house. Right. Okay. So and you'll get your deposit back. So you have those eight or 10 days and some people let that slide and then they find a problem and now contractually they're an uphill battle. And even when they do hire a home inspection service that they look at it, there are limitations of what a home inspector can do. So for example, if the house is 30 years old or 50 years old, those are 30, 50 year old pipes and wiring. They don't take cameras and put cameras down the pipes or in take down walls to see what's behind the walls. They can only inspect what's physically, uh, they can visibly see. So there are limitations on what they do. And a lot of those uh, home inspections have exclusions. They'll say, hey, there's a problem with this electrical, but you have to get a licensed contractor to, to really give you the right answer. And then they think there might be recourse with that home inspector because they failed to say that the roof is, leaking. Let's say a roof is leaking and they fail to identify that. There might be a clause in their contract that says, well, if you, as far as recourse, uh, we'll give you back your money if there's a major problem. 
not that they could be sued for the damage to the roof. So right. you might have paid, a, you know, five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars for an inspection service, and that's about what you're going to get back. So my point is that before you buy a house, <clears throat> that old saying "buyer beware" is extremely important. It's extremely important that you really um, investigate the, the house and make sure that it doesn't have defects that are going to cause you a fortune. You know, there are plenty of movies out there. What's that one um, um, with Michael Douglas where they – Money Pit, right? Okay, right. Where right. they buy this house and they find all these problems. Well, that's the real world, actually. Things like that do happen. So I would say whatever state you're in, get an attorney to look at your contract. Get an attorney to help guide you through the closing process because once uh, you close and you get a deed – Everything changes. The laws change, and in each state is might be a little bit different. But in Florida, it's called a merger doctrine. It, it merges, so now the contract really is extinguished, and we're only talking about a deed. So unless there's fraud involved, you're not going to recover. I don't care if it's a hundred thousand dollars in damage; it's going to be extremely difficult to to do that. And many many contracts um, are as is. So you touched so, on a lot of uh, legal issues that have popped up in my mind. Let's see if I can just address a couple of them with you. The first one is the inspection. Now, I, if I remember from my Florida home buying days, my realtor uh, did not give us one inspector. He would say, look, here is a list of about 10 different inspectors because the thought there is, is there a conflict between your agent and, and the inspector, because the, the agent wants the sale to go through. That's how the, the agent makes money off of the commission. And so will the agent not be inclined to recommend an inspector who's not going to find many problems? Because that way the sale can go through rather than yeah. sabotage you, you, you're it? Spot on, you're spot on that because they could be considered an agent themselves. If you're, if you're recommending somebody, that could potentially put them under liability because now they're part of you. You're part of they can be perceived if you did a hundred deals and it's always the same inspector you're given, well, you really have a really relationship. So now you're liable as well. So, yeah. So you got to be careful about those types of things. And, uh, you know, obviously every state's going to have its different laws, but right, right. it's really go in and, and make sure that you have somebody there that's reliable, that can inspect it. And if there's something that it shows and then read the report, my gosh, people don't read, you know, Read the report that you read the contract, see what it says, because the inspection report, if it identifies something, you now have an obligation to either get out of the contract within that time frame or know that you're going to have that problem when you move in. Now, I know as a general rule, when you uh, when you close, right, you had your chance to inspect the property. And so that's really on you and your inspector to 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 identify problems with the, the property. Uh, but as a general legal principle, would you agree with this or, or help, help me understand this? That doesn't excuse the seller from disclosing things that are, that's wrong with the property that the seller knows. Is that right, right or am I off on that? No, you're right. So I'll say in Florida, for example, if you um, have a roof leak and you um, paint it as you're the seller and you paint the roof, you paint the ceiling to hide a material defect, a material defect meaning that the roof leaks is a major right. problem, you hide a material defect, you can be liable in Florida to, because you hid that fact that that's fraud, basically, you, right. you know, that you hid that fact. So if there's something like that happening, yes, then that person, the seller, can be liable. And anybody that knew about it can be liable. So that's why, as a general rule, uh, if you are trying to sell your property, you want to disclose everything because now it's out on the table. And, and so, hey, should I disclose this? Should I not disclose it? You know what? Disclose it. And if it's not that big of a deal, it's going to go through inspections. The person's still going to buy your property because they want it. No one actually thinks a house that's 15 years old is brand new. Uh, and so, go when in doubt, just disclose it because uh, if you if you hide it back and conceal it, you could be getting yourselves into into legal trouble. All right. What about uh, you? Also mentioned earlier this idea about uninsured motorists. What, what is your thoughts on that? Well, I think a lot of people think that they don't need uninsured motorists because I, I think a lot of people just don't understand it. And one of the things that I'll say is that um, 
Nationally, I believe the average is about 13% of the people don't have insurance. In Florida, it's one of the highest. It's about 25, 26%. That's a lot of people that are uninsured. And I'm not talking, and there's a difference between not insured and being underinsured. Underinsured means you don't have enough coverage. So uninsured motorists basically think of it as this. Uninsured motorist is you get into an accident, the other party is at fault, and they don't have any insurance or they have the minimum amount of insurance. And now you say, I'd like to sue them because I'm injured and now I have medical bills, I've got pain and suffering. Well, if they don't have any insurance, and you might spend $20,000 trying to sue them personally, but it's likely that if they don't have insurance, they're not going to be able to pay that either. Right, right. So uninsured uh, uninsured motorist coverage basically acts like the at-fault driver. In other words, it's your insurance company, but they act like the at-fault driver. Okay. So you can recover from your own insurance company. So let's say you have $100,000 in uninsured motorist. Now you have coverage for yourself. You, it's like suing your own insurance company. You can sue for pain and suffering. You can sue for um, medical costs, things like that, and get recovery. Versus if they don't have any insurance and you don't have uninsured motorists, you're out of luck. Okay. So um, uh, to kind of give us an example here, let's say you're, you're driving your car. It's a $50,000 car. you got insurance on your car, and maybe you got medical coverage of, let's just say, 25000 uh, on right. your own personal policy. Now, if you get into an accident and and you are really injured and, and the person is not insured, your insurance is going to cover your car, uh, but it's only going to... If you have collision. If you, you have, have collision, collision. Right, if you have collision. Right. Uh, but it's only going... Yeah, I call it full coverage, but it's only going to cover your medical expenses up to your, your limit, $25,000 for medical. Now, Correct. if you had underinsured or uninsured motorist... Um, uh, that's like a hundred thousand, like your liability policy probably is. I think it's, it's standard 100, 300. Those actually, right. those were in the old days, maybe some 500, a million now, whatever. Uh, you want to at least get that for yourself in case you are hit by someone who is uninsured or underinsured. Is that the thought? Absolutely. You're spot on. All right. Well, that's uh, exactly it. You, you brought me back to my days when I used to sell insurance. Uh, way back in the day, before college, or before law school, I sold <laughs> insurance for country companies' insurance. By the way, I've heard this uh, study before. It's actually a joke, but it's also a real study. Do you, you know who the three lowest respected professions are in, in, the, in the United States? No. All right. Car salesman. Insurance agent and lawyer, and so when I was <laughs> when I was an undergrad, I I sold Hondas for Frank and Kona Honda, and then I went graduated from college, sold insurance for country companies insurance, and now I'm a lawyer. People ask me what is next now. What, what next can I do? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe run for office. I have no idea what's next on. But I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel. Well, uh, hey, one last thought here before I let you go, and thank you so much for your time today. But do you have a favorite legal movie? I like to ask that of all my guests, but uh, do you have a favorite legal show or legal movie you want to pass along? Favorite legal movie? Right. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll, it's not a legal movie, but one of my favorite movies is My Cousin Vinny. <laughs> what do you mean that's not a legal movie? <laughs> that is the greatest legal movie of all time. Uh, I, I have right, well, also... It's for entertainment, but you know what I mean. So we actually yeah. we actually <laughs> use that to teach a class on cross examination. And since you brought it up, Judge oh, Posner, really? yeah, Judge <laughs> Posner, who was a, a Seventh Circuit judge, highly respected uh, judge, he he actually said in a written opinion that my cousin Vinny is one of the best movies to teach the law from when it comes to interviewing witnesses, you know, charming the jury, uh, things like that. And so, um, yeah, I, I you you are spot on. You know what? I'm, I'm kind of scared a little bit about how alike yours and my mind works. We are both <laughs> Rocky fans, and we both love my cousin Vinny. And so, well, hey, thank you, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to, to talking with us today and uh, getting to know a little bit about your story. A fascinating story. How at the age of sixty, you decided now's the time to go out and practice law. One wonders what's next on your horizon. I don't know. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, what? Hey, th- we actually had two presidential candidates that were both in their mid 70s. I- any thoughts about politics? No, none at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. hey, you still have several years to go before you actually uh, announce your, your candidacy. But all right, well, thank you so much. Go out and enjoy your Florida weather and um, uh, good luck in your endeavors. Joel, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. We'll talk soon. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a five-star review. We need your love to help us continue highlighting the funnier side of the law. I want to give a special shout-out to our Vice President of Operations, Wendy Oster, without whom this entire operation would be a mess. Sean Wynn and 15.5 Features for making me sound way better than I actually do. Brooke Bolin for spreading the good word about us. And Ryan Kuhn and Paul Kuhn of Triplicity Marketing for our technical and computer support. <laughs> <laughs>